back to weapon select. Long range shooters are a uh, very similar class to one we've already talked about, the short range shooters. And so a lot of the, the same mechanics are going to apply, a lot of the same way that you're going to want to move around. Uh, but the positioning is going to be very, very different. And one thing that you'll also notice is that these weapons tend to be slower. Um, just across the board, slower play style. Um, this fire rate is just a lot slower than the fire rate that you're going to get out of something like the splash matic So that has some implications for movement on top of, um, obviously kill time and things like that. If you're trying to paint a line for yourself, it takes a little bit longer, and sure your line is gonna be longer, but a lot of the time what matters more than getting that straight line out in front of you for movement is being able to swim into it quickly. And having shots that don't go out quite as quickly definitely have an impact on your ability to take closer range engagements. That's not to say that in a pinch, you know, if you get jumped on, you can't snap to someone and hit some shots, um, and given good positioning and very, very careful defensive painting, you can often win before they get into range against any frontline weapon that's trying to rush you. And that is the big advantage of being long ranged. Um, but it also restricts your movement like we've talked about and restricts where it is that you're going to want to position. In the backline positioning basics video, I talk about how when you have longer range, it's important to make sure you keep that range that you're not letting your opponents get close to you by using cover. My range doesn't matter if I'm standing right here and there's someone who is right around this corner. I can't hit them right now, and as soon as they pop out around the corner, they're in range of me. Um, so shorter ranged weapons will try to use cover to get close to you, which means you need to be very careful about how you approach cover. If you're gonna try and come around this corner, then again, it should be moving something like this or, you know, throwing a bomb if you have one. I'm so sorry, Splattershot Pro players. Um, and generally playing a lot more carefully and moving up more when you have control and pressure from other members of your team. So if you're not going to be pushing up as much, what are you going to be doing? Because this isn't an anchor weapon exactly. This weapon doesn't paint very well at all, so it's hardly something you could consider a support. What you're going to be using a weapon like this for a lot of the time is crossfire, creating a situation where your teammate has taken a fight, but you're in a position far enough away to finish it without the opponent being able to contest you, especially because they're looking at somebody else. So your job is to put some pressure on someone from far enough away that they can't even approach you and to kite anybody who gets too close. Um, that's the case for a lot of the weapons we're talking about, but of course, there are going to be some exceptions here and there. So let's get talking about the first individual case we're going to talk about, uh, which is going to be, oops, we went a little bit past it, which is going to be uh, the Custom Junior. Uh, just kidding, this is a very short range shooter, but we didn't talk about it because it wasn't out at the time the short range shooters video launched. So I figure might as well package it in with this one here. So um, the Custom Junior is one of the premier support weapons in the game right now. Um, to refresh our memory for those of us who maybe haven't seen or haven't seen in a while, the weapon rules video for the What Am I Doing Part 1, a support weapon is a weapon that focuses on locking in turf that has been taken by their front line. So if you've got something like a 52 gal pushing up, and focused on holding the enemy team back as they stand up here, your job is to take the space that they've already claimed by being a threat to the enemy team and forcing them back and painting it up so that even if they force your teammate back, now there's this whole wall of paint in the way. So that's one thing you're gonna do with your paint. Another thing you're gonna do with your paint though is to spam paint as quickly as you can to get as many specials as you can and to make sure that every single time you are in a major engagement that your, your team needs help, um, you have a special ready to go to help shift that engagement in your team's favor. Now, those are typical supportive roles, um, but another major aspect of this weapon that makes this supportive role worth it to the team, because those things by themselves, you could probably find a weapon that's going to be able to both paint 
and uh, get a special that's helpful while also fighting and being successful in fights, the Splashmatic, for example. But one thing that this particular weapon has and, and that, that most support weapons need in order to be viable is a very safe way to poke from distance that will do more than just apply paint pressure. It will also actually apply damage pressure uh, from a safe distance where you don't have to be putting up this main weapon's bad accuracy in very short range against a weapon that slays better. And in this case, that comes from a torpedo. Torpedoes are really, really annoying because while they may not necessarily have damage threat all the time, they will at least force the opponent to aim up and shoot at them. Aiming up does a couple of annoying things. Uh, one of them is it takes your aim away from your opponents, but number two is that it cuts your peripheral vision. You can see from here, I cannot see anywhere near as much as the stage. And if you're positioning these torpedoes right, you're going to be putting the, be, them like behind players. You're going to be launching them like around them so that they... Okay, there are way too many targets in here to get this super accurately. Um, but the general game plan is... Let's see if I can get one on that, that target up there. That'll be a good example. So that it's not going to lock on to anything else. Uh, if you throw something from here, that's kind of annoying. But if you're able to throw it kind of behind them or to the side of them... That makes it so that they have to turn further and further away from where they're trying to look at your team. Uh, and the further away they have to look from your team, the more dangerous that torpedo is to them. The more likely it is to either hit them or force them to turn away and miss information that they need in order to win a fight. Torpedoes are really frustrating for crab tanks because crab tanks do not like to turn around. Crab tanks turn very slowly. Turning around is usually a matter of dropping into ball form, so completely abandoning any time that they've spent charging up their rapid fire shots and having to turn elsewhere, roll elsewhere. It wastes some time that they're using on their special. So if you're threatening them with a torpedo in the back, that's one way that you can, from a safe distance, force them to spend some of the time that they would otherwise be spending splatting your teammates on playing defensively. Another thing that's really great for this weapon in crab meta is that Wavebreaker hits through crab tank armor. So you have a way to threaten the most powerful special in the game right now with two aspects of your kit. Um, and so that makes this a weapon that while it's not you know, an aggressive weapon that's going to be taking fights on the front lines as a default mode, is able to have a significant impact on fights while also painting a lot and getting a special that's really valuable to the team. Um, so that combination of different aspects is going to make this a relatively useful weapon, even at top levels of play. Um, another thing that's interesting about this weapon in this particular game is that it's a little bit more useful in combat than it used to be, um, just by nature of the map design. There are fewer open sight lines that you can't avoid, and so there's less time that you're going to be out against weapons that outrange you, which means that you're often going to be able to actually use the main weapon if you get a, a good sharking opportunity. Um, the main weapon on the junior is not to be slept on. It is a very fast killing weapon as long as you hit the shots. The as long as you hit the shots is the hard part. Um, getting in range to hit the shots and dealing with this absolutely horrendous aim RNG. It's not as bad as the arrow spray, but it is definitely in the same neighborhood. Um, if you can deal with that, then this weapon actually splats about as fast as something like an end zap. It is definitely a viable fighting weapon in its own range. The trick is just getting into its own range. And since that's so difficult, a lot of the time this is going to rely on torpedoes. And that means that it's going to rely on a lot of uh, ink efficiency. So I, for example, am definitely going to be running Last Ditch Effort on this. A lot of people would go for something a little bit less aggressive than Ninja Squid, uh, but this is, this is me, and I must, I must be myself. So let's jump into a match here. Uh, I don't want to risk my X power for playing weapons I don't know, so we'll run series instead. All right, uh, we're on Mahi Mahi, which means this is going to be annoying. We've had another custom... We have three torpedoes on our team. This is going to be a good illustration of how annoying this is. Uh, very aggressive team comp that we've got here, really. We've got, like, a lot of paint. We've got a lot of forward pressure. Uh, we just need to make, be careful about, like, the dually squelchers range. But, like, here, I can push this. 
because I have a better kill time than they do. Um, fortunately, their teammates didn't help out, and so now we're totally fine. And we can just sit back here, regain our health, regain our ink, spam some torpedoes. This player is trying to get in behind our teammates, so I'm going to try and stop that. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to chase that too much further. I'm a little too far behind for that. Uh, but I'm just going to play a little bit backline-y here because I don't want flanks to come in, and I'm still having an impact by being as far away as I am. Rolling torpedoes is a pretty good damage combo. I'm going to try and get this out before I die. Okay, they didn't actually go after me. They probably should have. Um... Rolling Torpedoes can be a good damage combo if they're already hurt a little bit. Because it'll detonate much more quickly and more reliably. So if you need just a quick extra 60 damage, that's one of the quickest ways you can get it. And because we are so mobile, we're able to kind of skitter out of some engagements and skirmish a little bit sometimes. Now that... Uh, Okay, team is handling the clams. I was going to say, now that we're starting to run out of clams, I'm going to make sure that uh, we're keeping those in, because this is something that, uh, as a support weapon, it's often your job uh, to be the one who's relaying clams back and forth in clam blitz. The rest of the team is going to be more helpful for holding the baskets, and so you can just, like, throw a torpedo, and while that torpedo is making its slow trip over to the enemy team you are going to be able to just go into mid and collect some clams. They do not know that I'm here. Um, something that is also really beneficial about this weapon that I haven't talked about yet is the vision that you gain from playing it. Um, both the torpedo and the wave breaker are going to give you meaningful information about enemy positions um, that your other your teammates can play off as well as yourself. Oh, I, I thought I had that. That's unfortunate. So this is a bit of a <laughs> aggressive play, but I can probably make this work here. Okay, cool. That, that last play I do not recommend. That was a, a gem playing Slayer moment. But, uh, I mean, it does show off that the weapon can, under some circumstances, be used for combat. And that you shouldn't get too used to the idea that you are a support to the extent that you don't take a fight when you know you would win it. All right. Oh, I'd say that's a pretty good start. And of course, uh, because the map mode's reset, it's not going to actually show us the end screen. So let's go jump into that really quickly. Oh, whoops, too far. Still too far. So there's what that looked like. So, notice the most paint aspect of it. That is definitely going to be a part of your playstyle. Alright. So, on to the actual long-range shooters. Sorry for making y'all wait even just a little bit more. We'll start with the Splattershot Pro. Um, the vanilla Splattershot Pro is not a particularly strong weapon, competitively speaking. Uh, but the main weapon does have some strengths. It has significant range compared to other frontline shooters. Um, so it's going to be able to stay from further back and take positions that uh, the frontline weapons can't push because they'd be pushing into its range. It's a very accurate weapon. Um, there's not going to be a lot of drift on this. And its kill time is serviceable for the range that it has. Um, it's definitely nowhere near as fast as something like a 52 gal, but it is definitely enough that you can get away with uh, using it to go for some Slayer plays here and there. Um, it excels in positions where its teammates are getting attention so that it can go in and finish a fight against a frontline weapon that just doesn't have the range to oppose it. Now, it also has the strongest special in the game. 
However, it is the weakest weapon for charging that best special in the game. So despite the fact that it does have crab tank, it also won't get a lot of crab tanks. And if you're playing the weapon for the crab tank, then you're going to end up playing a weapon that gets the crab tank considerably faster. Um, up until this point, that has been the splash o -matic. People are currently experimenting with the splat dualies to see if that might be a way to supplant it now that the splat dualies can get it slightly faster. Um, but there are a lot of strengths that the splash o still has, even over the splat dualies kit for the main and sub weapon that are making them consider otherwise. So, this weapon largely gets left out of that conversation. Um, there is an argument that I would hear to take the L3 nozzle nose over this weapon as a long range crab, crab tank alternative because of angle shooter. Angle shooter is not doing anything for this weapon. Um, you might as well just fire another shot because your shot does more damage than the angle shooter does. The extra vision is usually not something that you care about individually that much because you're going to be playing this long range shooter play style where you're checking your corners, where you're making sure not to push in too blindly. So the information can help for sure, but it's information that you are not going to selfishly be working off a lot of the time because you're just not going to take angles where you're going to get approached very often. You are not the player who is going to be rushing into those engagements. It's a much more supportive thing for your team to have that information. And point sensors are a much better collector of this information because they will cover a much wider area um, and require a lot less precision to use. And since the damage is so negligible and the trail lasts for so little time, it's often more worthwhile for you to have the longer uptime of the point sensor than to have the damage plus information combo of the angle shooter. So this is a weapon you're very rarely going to see in competitive play just because the, the players who are running it will have considered a lot of different options before this. But... That's not to say it doesn't have its proponents. Uh, Dude has been known to play this weapon. Um, and there are some, uh, some like, especially mid or low level teams who will want a crab tank, will have someone who's capable of playing a long range shooter, and will say, well, I mean, this covers both of those bases, so let's put it in there. Let's go and see if we can get ourselves out of S plus 7 today, shall we? This weapon, by the way, is a very good weapon because of its accuracy to use for aim practice. If you have something that's a little bit more random and you want a weapon that's just going to be a decent long range, it's going to reach a lot of targets that will help you practice this reticle control. So, for example, if you're trying to play, I don't know, a Nova, you're not going to get very accurate information about whether you're hitting the targets playing that weapon in practice. So, it might be worth doing some aim drills on the Splattershot Pro instead. Uh, okay. I'm not a huge fan of running Splattershot Pro with another weapon that doesn't paint very well. Um, the weapon paints decently, except for the fact that it runs itself out of ink quickly. And that lack of efficiency is why we consider it not to be a very good painter, and why it doesn't get special very fast. That and the fire rate being somewhat lackluster both play into the special charge aspect, but, uh, the ink efficiency in particular is, is a known issue for this weapon. I would assume a lot of people would consider playing uh, some ink efficiency gear to make up for that. Okay, so now we're just going to rev up and force players off of the zone. Hmm. Another issue with the weapon having angle shooter is that ink efficiency, because with angle shooter taking up that much more of your tank for as little value as it gives, a lot of the time it's just not worth the ink that you're spending on it. That is an issue that we will discuss once again when we get to the jet squelcher and all like good. I'm a little bit too close to mid there and they probably should have pushed me, uh, but they let me back up. You'll notice that in a lot of these fights I'm keeping to a certain range, I'm not trying to engage like I was with the Junior, I'm keeping far enough away from them that I can hit them and they can't hit me. I'm going to pre-fire that because I don't want them coming over the top of it. If they stay in the corner, that's fine. 
Although I would have liked it if uh, we kept the zone in the meantime. Um, but we'll just crab tank from here again. They haven't shown signs of being able to stop this. Unfortunately, someone got on top of me, but I was able to bump them with the crab first, and so I only needed two shots to be able to splat them, and it looked like they were also missing a few. I can't hit them from there, so I'm trying to do damage with the angle shooter. It's not going to do a lot of damage, but uh, it might make them move a little bit. Very be good. We can probably move up at this point. I would like for a teammate to be in front of me here, ideally. We do have that. Now I can put Crossfire on from here. I'm actually going to take this Crab Tank position. This is one of the strongest Crab Tank positions on the map. That player is very close to dead, but I'm going to have to... What? Okay, I guess I got someone I didn't see. Alright, that's pretty good there. We've got a hold. Oh, no. Bumped the level geometry. Dunked my head. We're going to threaten this Explosher. They are one of the best at painting weapons on the enemy team. And so they are going to be a threat to be able to cap the zone. So getting their attention, even if I didn't get the kill, would have been worth it. I'm actually surprised that was able to kill. I don't know what damaged them prior. But we are going to win the game. All right. Another pretty good showing. Now that we've talked about the Splattershot Pro, it feels only fitting to talk about the Forge Splattershot Pro. Uh, which is a much more popular version of the weapon in competitive play, and for uh, th the simple reason that it has a bomb that's not angle shooter. In fact, it has one of the better bombs in the game, the uh, suction bomb, which is a very good supportive bomb that will take up a lot of space and be a huge threat to anywhere it lands. And it has Booyah Bomb, which has always been one of the best specials in the game ever since its release in Splatoon 2. So this combination of abilities, you know, obviously Crab Tank is arguably one of the more desirable, but Booyah Bomb is a very close second a lot of the time on, on people's kind of special tier lists, with the exception of missiles, which you can't get from very many weapons. And so you've got basically the next best thing past the Crab Tank, plus you've got an actual bomb to work with, and that makes for a much more functional kit. Um, this weapon, again, is not going to be up there scrapping an awful lot, but if it does get in there and it really needs to get itself out of there, it can potentially panic Booyah. Again, you never want to really be panic specialing. Um, I've said this a lot about the Booyah Bomb, but the Booyah Bomb works much, much better when it is deployed proactively to start a fight rather than to get you out of a fight and, and save your skin. Um, so you always want to be kind of using this from the midline and kind of letting the fights develop in front of you, taking a fight when you see a good one to take, but making sure that you're keeping your range from the opponent, that you're not allowing people to get too close to you, and that when you're booyah bombing, you're doing so with the idea in mind of letting your frontline weapons get in and start the fight for you so that you can then finish it. The weapon is still outclassed, arguably, for its niche of mid-range booyah bomb weapon by the sloshing machine, um, the issue being that it just does not farm that Booyah Bomb as fast, um, despite the ink consumption nerf to the sloshing machine. Um, and it's going to run out of ink quickly still, which is an issue both because of the main weapon having a really dry ink tank, but also because of the suction bomb being very intensive on the ink tank and it actually being worth throwing. So there is a lot more downtime on this weapon. There is a lot of time that you're going to spend not being able to fire it. And so you have to account for that in your positioning, which makes it a little bit more passive in addition to the range considerations. There is an E-leader on the other team, and yeah, they were looking at us there. So that is something we have to be very careful about with our positioning there. We are not able to contest that especially well. Uh, you get weapons that are a little bit more capable of handling it from something like the Squeezer, which we'll talk about later. Uh, that was a little bit greedy of me, but we actually still traded it back. But uh, against frontline weapons, that's where we're really going to shine as long as we keep our distance, unlike what I did there by tunneling on the heavy splatling instead of dealing with the carbon that was right in front of me. I'm checking this corner here because I saw someone trying to come around it. And again, I need to keep my distance away from this uh, brush. But since they went on my teammate, I'm able to pro provide Slayer support, and we win that easy peasy. That player goes down, and now this should probably be the game. Um, even if they splat us all, I don't think they have time to get in. 
There's one who's dropping down to this side, so I'm just going to put some suppressive fire, not that they're going to be able to paint anything at all, and we win the game. Definitely a couple situations there where I should have died. One situation where I did die that I shouldn't have put myself in. So a little bit too aggressive on the play there, but... Wait, was that Tetsu? Was that actually Tetsu? I would explain why that went so quickly. Uh, if it's the Tetsu I'm thinking of, uh, Tetsu was one of the original uh, top players to start playing Bamboo uh, back in Splatoon 2 days. I could see that being the case. That's a very solid performance from them. Um, I'm going to really quickly go and refresh the catalog because I just maxed it out. All right. Getting started again. We're going to switch over to the 96 gal. 96 gal is one of a couple of long-range shooters that have a fact. Um, this weapon is not seen an awful lot in competitive play for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is Ink Fact. Ink Fact is considered one of the weaker specials in the game right now. It is highly situational. That's not to say it doesn't have any uses. It is better than, you know, just press this button and you're probably going to get splatted. But in most situations, you probably are going to get splatted for using it. Um, it needs a very particular scenario in order to make any sense to pull off. And so a lot of the time you put yourself, you know, out there in your typical position, you get an ink fact and you're like, okay, what, what can I actually accomplish with this thing? Um, and the answer might not be much. So that's one issue with it. Um, ink fact is something that people have learned how to counterplay really well. Um, you can flank it. You can put it in a position where if it approaches too close, then you can flank it. You can fight someplace else on the map. You can literally just run away from it. And what is it going to do? Waddle at you slowly. That's not very threatening. Um, what you can also do, depending on the weapon, is just focus it and fill up the, the vacuum so that then when it's trying to fire its shot, your shots are immediately hitting the user. Now, they can retaliate by firing the shot, but there is significant lag time between when they actually fire the shot and when they can move again. During all that time where the meter was charged, but I was still in the process of firing the shot, I can be splatted, and it doesn't take a very long time for most of the weapons that are going to be up there pushing you to be able to splat you. A Hydra Splatling can do that on a full charge. Just get a full charge, launch all of it into the ink vac, the ink vac fills up and the Hydra splats them with the next four shots that they fire and it's very difficult to hit them. Uh, especially with a projectile like the ink vac projectile which moves so slowly and cannot be aimed at arcs that you would maybe like to be able to hit over the top of cover or something. So, very situational special, do not panic pop ink vac. That is usually going to do more damage than it's worth. Um, better off a lot of the time just relying on keeping your distance safely and using the main weapon. Um, the sprinkler would be more useful if it had a special that you really wanted to charge up for. The 96 gal in Splatoon 2 was used for ink armor spamming because it could throw a sprinkler out there, get this valuable ink armor, pop that for the team, and still be applying mid-range pressure as opposed to, say, the Junior or the Enzap that really have to get a lot more in your face to be able to take a fight. Um, and uh, so you might see a 96 gal used in something like a chip damage comp where the goal is just do chip damage across multiple members of the team, maybe like chip some armor with one weapon and then finish them off with another, that kind of idea. And so it had a niche there, but since Ink Fact is, again, not a very spammable special, not something you just want to be using willy-nilly, um, the sprinkler gets even less value than it usually does, which is not much. Um, you're using this mostly for movement and mostly for a distraction or a shot block against the enemy team. You might use it to poke in some instances where you can't reach very far, but you can reach most of the way that you can throw a sprinkler. Like, that's max throw distance. I can shoot about that far. So most of the time, I'm just going to want to rely on the 96 cal instead. Um, so the main weapon is definitely the strongest part of this kit. I think it'll be reconsidered a little bit more once it gets another kit, but it's also not a very fast weapon. You can see the strafe speed on this is really, really sluggish. Um, compare that to something like, we'll take an extreme example of, say, the Wiper. Um, you look at how fast you can move while you're attacking here. It's just night and day. Um, 
So the 96 is very stationary and turret-like a lot of the time, um, which makes it so that if you need to press up with it, it's not going to be able to do that super well. It's like the, uh, the problem that the Pro has where you don't want to move up very fast because of angles, but it has even more range, so it has even more of that problem, and it's less capable of moving while it shoots. So it's even more passive in its role as a crossfire support. Another thing that's important to recognize with all the GAL weapons is that their aim RNG is horrendous. You will just randomly miss shots sometimes when it's not your fault. Um, and so this is one of those weapons where there might be a, an argument for actually trying to learn to aim using a weapon like the Splattershot Pro so that you're not missing shots because of the weapon, you're learning on an accurate weapon and then taking that to this weapon and being a little bit more sure of your aim rather than maybe getting some shots that wouldn't normally miss or getting some shots that wouldn't normally hit. But you can manage your accuracy to a degree by only firing a couple of times. You only need two shots. So after at most three shots, often just two shots, just always drop down to the ink and move and reset your aim RNG again. All right. Very odd comp that we've got and a very normal comp that they've got. They've got double tri-strike. So that might be something that I might want to focus my uh, ink facts on. On preventing those from impacting the zone. Uh, ink fact is f a, a bit better in zones because you can keep them from playing the objective while you have it. You can just put yourself up here and now you're just going to get the objective for that because they're not able to paint it themselves. But then heh, you're immediately going to lose it again because you have to back up and you weren't putting any paint down the entire time yourself and sometimes your team just goes down. So. Well, that's unfortunate. I had not want them to be dropping down there. It wasn't particularly safe for me to be helping them. I'm going to wait for this tri strike to go off because it looks like we have enough of an advantage right now. I might need to use it here just to save myself. Right. I'll fire that over there because that's a point where we don't want them to be standing. There we go. One drops down over here. I'm going to make sure that they can't get onto my, my left flank here. I'll put some pressure on that player. Hopefully our team can collapse. They can. Charger's on the upper right, so I'm going to try and play around this angle and maybe see if I can get a, a, some threat on them. Make sure so that they can't move in quite as aggressively. Unfortunately, they did hit a shot, I think. Wow, that was a good shot. I didn't think that they could reach that. So we're going to lose the zone here in all likelihood. We have too few players and they're off the zone but they did rotate to it and they're keeping it act actually pretty well Let's see if this uh, sprinkler can help at all with the tri strike out i don't expect to be able to keep it yeah um and you can see i'm running dangerously low on ink there which is a reason that i'm backing up but the sprinkler is definitely helping with keeping that if i had been able to react a little bit faster i might have tried to in fact, the tri strikes, but. Wasn't able to get. Ooh, wow. Yeah, they're, they're reading my movement there. I was thinking I was out of range, but they pushed up very aggressively, knowing that there was nobody in the zone to contest them. So, smart play from them. I'm watching out for the E-Leader. I don't want to get sniped from up here. I'm just trying to get my specials so that we can get to the zone and make sure that it's not getting taken out. I'm going to need to back up here because I'm about to get my shot. And yeah, I didn't back up fast enough. So the E-Leader is just able to snipe me. And that's a pretty common thing to happen. That uh, if you get too far in at all with the Ink Fact, it's just not going to work. Looks like we're probably getting locked out here. I don't really see anything we can do about this. Enemy team is just kind of standing still. So you can see there are some pieces there that can maybe situationally work in zones. Uh, but the weapon is ink hungry enough that it's probably not your first, uh, first choice if you're trying to go for just spam the zone with paint and then ink vac. You can see also how the weapon 
is uh, going to struggle a bit against something like an E-Leader. Granted, that is Lux, a known competitive player, in all likelihood. But uh, that feels about how the weapon really kind of feels to play. So, Jet Squelcher, how the mighty have fallen. Um, this is a weapon that was meta for a long time at the end of Splatoon 2. Um, because it was able to basically spam paint for Stingray faster than anything else in the game. And then it was able to use that special very impactfully. Once again, uh, the special here is Inkvac. And a kit that previously was able to spam paint to farm for this special and make use out of it that way, now has a special that's not worth spamming. Not on top of that, it also received the line marker. So, yeah, there, there, there are some, uh, some weapons in the long-range shooters that have been cursed by their kits a little bit. Um, the Jet Squelcher is, is nowhere near what it once was. Still sees some situational use. Um, if you do want an Ink Fact, this is probably one of the uh, other weapons that you might consider running, if not a Charger. Charger is definitely the one that's probably preferred at top level. Um, but if someone doesn't have the muscle memory on a charger, but you still really want an ink vac, then this might be what you go for. Um, the 96 would be another option, but the 96 is a little bit more vulnerable and a little bit less able to move, uh, move back and paint for the vac and then get back in. Um, just a little bit of extra range makes, uh, I think, a big difference for the jet squelcher. So even though its kill time is vastly, vastly worse, um, it's not doing too badly. And this is a weapon which you might think, oh, well, maybe it gets a damage combo from the line marker. Nope. It is still a four shot, even if one of those shots is a line marker. Puts you at 99. Doesn't get you there. Now, if someone's, you know, touched enemy ink or something, it might be worth going for. Or if you see that they're already damaged, maybe you can, like, hit a couple of shots. And then as they get away, try and s snipe the, the last remaining area with the line marker but uh it's really not in a great state as a weapon this this kit is not going to move the weapon to success anytime soon at least in the competitive setting so once again we will be trying to play a little bit for paint and a little bit for uh ink fact to get our team onto the zone and then uh from there we'll just be taking whatever fights we can trying to avoid any long-ranged weapons while also harassing them where we can with our long range. Um, and we are definitely a threat against an exposed frontline weapon. They do not want to stay out here for too long because we are going to be doing some damage to them. This is also another fairly accurate weapon. Um, it gets a little bit worse at super long ranges. There are some times where if you let the bloom go too far, it will start to make you miss shots. But uh, still pretty good for testing like your long range accuracy if you want to be practicing, you know, a long-ranged weapon, and it's going to have shooter-like mechanics. All right, up against an E-Leader, and this is something that is going to be very difficult for... Oh, actually, we've got an Explosher to work with, too. Um, we might be able to make this work. Fighting against an E-Leader one-on-one, though, is going to be really hard because it just has so much more range than us that we have to pick our positions extremely carefully. What in the world was that bounce? Why did it go straight up? This is a weird level geometry quirk or something. I don't like that our team is staying in so far when we're clearly two down and we have lost control. That's going to lead to us staggering a bit there. Ooh, yeah, that's bad. Ah, I tried to drop down to use the uh, glass for cover, but... I was marked and I was staying out there for too long. So I cre I extended the stagger and then somebody else is extending it. We're oh. oh boy. Hopefully they don't know I'm here. Yeah, it looks like they don't. So I will at least be able to challenge this junior. Clear. Okay, we got two down. So now we might be able to move in on zone. Gotta watch out for the try strikes. They're going to try and slow us down as much as they can. But we should be able to get in there. And from here, I will be looking to get a good ink back on as soon as they start making a real effort to contest the zone. I am again going to try and keep my range like I am with the other long range shooters. I'm going to pop this to save my team from the uh, crab tank, although it will get shredded very quickly by the crab tank, and that is 
the same issue I was talking about with the Hydra. Um, granted, I'm not excellent with the uh, Ink Fact here, but it is a very difficult thing to stay alive in that situation because you have to anticipate when it's going to get shredded and try and uh, get out of the way. With another weapon, another backline weapon, I might be able to actually splat the E-Leader with the amount of time that I was able to shoot shots at them, but given the slowness of this main weapon, I was only able to scare them a little bit, and even then I almost got sniped for it. Let's see if we can find an angle on the crowd tank here to let us get this. Okay, we're going to need to back up in a big way. Fortunately, we had the whole escape route painted, and so now we can back up and tight, and we actually get a successful pick off of that. We're going to pop this here, and unfortunately I did not get it out to be able to suck up the Ink Strike beacons. And I'm going to look really silly if that's not actually a thing that works. I am not a, uh, an ink back user, so it's something I have not actually tested out. And there again, you know, stand still for too long, E-Leader's going to make a mess of things, so. In case it isn't clear, I'm not a huge recommender of uh, a lot of the weapons that we've played so far. There is a place for them, and there are definitely people who will play them better than I will. But uh, they are not very strong in the current competitive ecosystem. All right, so maybe we're not going to win this ticket after all. We'll have to see. Uh, but we still got one more shot at it. And that is going to be with pauses to continue the, the thing. The Splatter Shot Nova. Oh, dear. Um, so, yeah, maybe we're not going to do it. The Splattershot Nova did receive a buff recently, uh, which improves it, but not, not by a lot. So, here's the thing with the Splattershot Nova. The kit is fine. Um, point sensor is not terrible. In fact, a lot of what this weapon does is actually point sensor spam to make sure that there's uh, information for your team. And the special is pretty solid. Like, not very many weapons are ever going to complain about getting Killer Whale. The problem is the main weapon. I just fired, I believe, seven shots, maybe six, and that was what it took to splat. Now the weapon is a five shot, except you can count on one of those shots to miss. Maybe two of them. This weapon is horrendous in the, the area of accuracy. Um, they... They have a gimmick where the weapon's accuracy never gets any worse than it is while you're continuing to fire, which would be great, except that its accuracy starts out so, so bad. This is not a weapon that hits a lot of shots, even if they're aimed well. You can see there. So, you've got a weapon with a slower fire rate than the arrow spray that needs to hit more shots than the arrow spray and is still really, really inaccurate, just like the arrow spray is. This weapon is one of the weakest combat weapons in the entire game. The only advantage that it has is its range, which, if you're playing a weapon for this range, just pick up the Splattershot Pro. It's right there. Um, they gave it a painting buff in an attempt to give it a niche that... Um, the Splattershot Pro does not just straight up beat it for, which would be to output specials more quickly. And that painting buff was substantial, but it's still kind of lackluster paint. It's not the best. It's not something you're going to be using like a typical support weapon. And one of the issues with the long-range shooters and paint is that if you're trying to paint for combat utility then you need to spend longer on making your lines so that they connect, because otherwise it gets really patchy like this. This is the best idea for painting for special, but this is not very swimmable paint. If you're going for swimmable paint, like a short-range shooter can provide very quickly, you're going to have to spend a lot longer making sure that those lines all connect. So the Splattershot Nova isn't a great support weapon, it's very, very poor at combat, and it's definitely not going to be anchoring with the kind of range that it's got, especially with 
having accuracy that bad the longer range it uh, tries to play from. What the weapon can do, and this is not I am this is not me arguing for it, but what the weapon can do is scout. Um, it's going to throw a lot of these point sensors, and it's going to make sure that every corner that it tries to, to take is going to be painted in very much the same way we've been describing. Just make sure that it's always safe. And when you do have a Splattershot Nova on your team, you're going to know if they're flanking. If you don't know that they're flanking, then you're not paying enough attention. Uh, because you're going to have corners painted, you're going to have players being kited, you're going to have point sensors all over the place, and you're going to have whales pointing you to the enemy players. Everything in its kit works pretty well for making sure that nobody sneaks up on you. That's about all it works well for, though, and that is not a sufficient niche for it to see competitive play. The, the main weapon's combat utility is holding it back massively. It is going to fold like paper if it gets pushed by any kind of frontline weapon with a reasonable time to kill. I'm very, very worried about these Tetras. They're going to be hard to hit, not just because of them rolling around, but because of my weapon's accuracy. And they aren't that much shorter range than I am, and their time to kill is just a, a not even comparable. Um, so the way that I'm going to have to get them is by playing very, very safe. And if they do decide to get on top of me, I am going to get pushed back very quickly. There we go. I think one of the shots uh, I benefited massively from the uh, uh, inaccuracy of the weapon. Because I was not aiming it right and it still hit anyway. Woo, that was scary. If they get one more roll or I miss one more shot there, they probably do splat me for that situation. Um, so even as advantageous as that was, the Tetra is looking at my teammate. I'm still really nervous about that fight. And those are just fights that like a weapon in Splatoon needs to be able to win. If, if you get that easy an opportunity, that good of an opening, your weapon had better deliver. <laughs> We're going to pop this because this player is getting really close to us and they could definitely push us in here, especially with the help of their team. They do actually manage to do so. Unfortunate. We don't have a lot of front line here, which is another problem. There's not a lot of players to be keeping the enemy team back away from me. Okay. They able to get a couple of assists there. Tetris are going to beat me here and there's really no way out of that for me. Uh, I could have tried to duck around the corner. I really needed my teammate to be looking at that. That was a bit of unawareness on their part. But, uh... Ugh. Not a lot I can do there. So. Unfortunately, we do not win the ticket. However, we made significant progress with the wins that we did get. And the, uh... Medals on the losses. So. Maybe we'll still make some progress.